Hello, my name is Annette Hansen. I have a PhD in materials and corrosion, and today I'm going to talk about materials and corrosion. My talk will focus on the hydrotreating reactor. It is designed for a temperature of 454 degrees C, and it may have a design pressure up to 150 bar D. We have feed and hydrogen coming in at multiple beds. Our feed contains corrosive species. It can be acidic compounds, it can be organic bound sulfur or H2S, it may be organic bound chlorides and organic bound nitrogen. These species are converted in the hydroprocessing reactor. They are becoming CO2, H2O, H2S, HCl and NH3. The amount of hydrogen we have into our reactor determines which steel that we have to use for our pressure cell. The acidic components we have determine which stainless steel we need to use as a weld overlay to ensure a long lifetime of our reactor. Hydrogen may cause cracking by the damage mechanism high temperature hydrogen attack. Hydrogen reacts with the carbides in the metal Fe3C forming methane. It's illustrated here where we have hydrogen going to the metal surface, dissociate and entering the steel and diffusing into it. Here it reacts with carbon or carbides forming methane that collects at voids. As pressure builds up, the voids becomes into blisters. These blisters transforms into micro cracks as the pressure builds up and they become macro cracks. This corrosion mechanism is a risk for temperatures above 200 degrees C. The risk increases with increasing temperature and hydrogen content. In order to have a steel that has sufficient resistance to high temperature hydrogen attack, it must contain carbide formers like chromium, vanadium and tungsten. The more it has of these carbide formers, the higher is the resistant. The way material is selected is based on the Nielsen curve. The Nielsen curve is published by the American Petroleum Institute. It is made from a collection of data from industry and from laboratory tests. Curves from, for each material has been drawn based on these data. For condition represented below the curve, the material is considered safe to use. At conditions above the curve, the material is considered susceptible to high temperature hydrogen attack. The red dot here on this slide marks the condition of our hydroprocessing reactor. For the conditions chosen here, we need to use 200 quarter chrome, one moly to have sufficient resistance. Had the pressure been lower, we could have used one and a quarter chrome half molly. Therefore, the shell is always made of low alloy steel, either one and a quarter chrome half molly or two and a quarter chrome half molly to have sufficient resistance to high temperature hydrogen attack. Acidic corrosion may cause localized thinning of our materials. The renewable feed contains acidic components either in the form of fatty acids as shown here they are long chain molecules, either with one or multiple double bounds. Renewable feeds may also contain resin acids. They are more branched as seen here. The acidity is measured by the total acid number. That is found by tritation with potassium hydroxide. We measure how many milligrams of potassium hydroxide we need to neutralize one gram of feed. Renewable feeds may have tan in between 0 and 200 milligram. The acidic components react with the steel forming a salt. These salts are highly solvable in the oil. The corrosion results in a surface which may show very localized thinning as seen on the picture here. We see no corrosion products on the surface. Instead, the corrosion products are transported along with the oil and they may deposit in the catalyst bed. The risk of this kind of corrosion occurs from 230 in fossil feed, 
but because we have a much higher acidity and different molecules, it is considered risk already from 150 in renewable feeds. The risk of corrosion increases with acidity, temperature and flow rate. The way to mitigate acidic corrosion is to select a stainless steel with sufficient resistance. We need a steel that contains molybdenum. The graph here on the slide shows test alloys with various amount of molybdenum that has been exposed in an oil with a tan of 210 at 250 degrees C for 500 hours. It's evident that the corrosion rate decreases as the molybdenum content increases. This can also be seen for commercial alloys. The table here show commercial alloys that has been exposed in a distillation of tall oil. The alloy 316L only contains two weight percent molybdenum and shows the highest corrosion rate. As the molybdenum content increases, the corrosion rate decreases and the commercial alloy 254SMO with six weight percent molybdenum shows hardly any corrosion. These two surfaces are pictures of samples that has been exposed in a real reactor. They have been exposed for a couple of years. The first one is of a steel without any molybdenum and we clearly see how corrosion is occurring on the surface. The bottom image is of a stainless steel with sufficient amount of molybdenum. Here we see no corrosion. In order to ensure a long lifetime for our hydroprocessing reactor, we need a base metal that has sufficient amount of resistance to high temperature hydrogen attack. Therefore, we use a steel containing chromium and molybdenum. It could be one and a quarter chrome half moly or two and a quarter chrome one moly. The steel is overlaid with a stainless steel containing molybdenum. This stainless steel is selected such that it has sufficient resistance to the acidic components in the feed. I hope this shows you how we select the material for reactors in hydroprocessing industry. Thank you very much for listening.